Brother Kennedy, Brother Lawrence Kennedy, are you uh, available to unmute and just open us in prayer this evening? Brother Kennedy, are you there? Oh, I think he's now con um, he's he's now connecting. All right, Sister Kathleen Aguilera, could you open us in prayer, please, Sister Kathleen? Hey, everybody's now connecting. <laughs> uh, Brother Kennedy, if you can hear me, could you un unmute and open us in prayer, please, Brother Lawrence Kennedy? Yeah, go ahead, brother. You're muted still, eh? You need to unmute. You're, you're muted still, brother Kennedy. You need to unmute. Apparently, he's having a little difficulty in um in unmuting. All right, uh, let me ask Sister Rachel Garen if she will open us in prayer. Sister Rachel, if you're online, get open us, please. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, O oh God, and we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, to gather together and to bless your name and to worship you, O oh God. We thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, to study we pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, even right now, oh God, that you, oh God, will touch the hearts of each and every one of us, oh God, as we prepare to listen and to learn from your word, oh God. We pray, oh God, that the word, the words of um, our hearts, oh God, and the meditation, the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts, oh God, will be acceptable unto you, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for this time that you will spend in your presence, oh God. And we pray, oh God, that, we, that the word, oh God, will grow deep roots in our hearts, oh God. We give you praise, and and glory, oh God. Bless the hearers, oh God. Bless pastor, oh God, as he ministers to us, oh God, and give us understanding, oh God. Help him to speak, oh God, under the guidance of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen, amen and amen. Well, we want to move into a little period of worship before we go into God's word. You know that the Lord always inhabits the praises of his people. So we want you to just take an opportunity right where you are. If you're in your car, if you're home, hopefully you're focusing your screen. Just worship the Lord with us and invite his presence. We now go to our period of worship.
yes, we will start our, our study. We were really enjoying it as we were really worshiping the Lord, more power. And, you know, even as we talk about more power, more strength, I think about the Apostle Paul's ministry in Ephesus and how he operated with a demonstration of power in the Holy Ghost, not just with enticing words of men's wisdom. And um, we talk a little bit about Ephesus and Paul's ministry there, but I invite you to read the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, to really see how Paul operated in Ephesus, because that's where we saw where he ministered in the church. Um, so today we're starting our study on, on the book of Ephesus, uh, or as we say, the book of Ephesians, which is written to the church at Ephesus. And um, tonight we're just going to do more or less an introductory um, session where we're just going to introduce, we're not going to go into, into much depth or much, much, much detail. Um, so we're talking about the, the, the book, book of Ephesus, and like I said, we may, the book to the Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and like I said, we may go through about, we stretch it out for about probably about 11 or 12 sessions, because we want to go line upon line, precept upon precept, and really study it word by word, verse by verse. But let me give you a little background, because it's very important to understand um, when you're studying the scripture to understand who it is written to and who wrote it, so you get a better idea of, of, of the context. So this evening, we're really going to contextualize the book before we actually get into, into the depths of, of, of the study. And as I look at the whole book, I, I broke it up into three sections, the Christian wealth, the Christian war, and the Christian warfare. Now, as it's obvious, the author is the Apostle Paul. And as I indicated just now, his ministry at Ephesus is covered in the book of Acts. You can read um, Acts chapter 18, from verse 18 to 21, Acts chapter 19, and Acts chapter 20. It was written probably around AD 60 to 63, while Paul was in prison in Rome. And as we go through the book, we will see where he makes reference to that. And Paul probably arrived in Rome in, in spring of 8060 or 61. And when we think about Paul in prison, it wasn't like a prison like we have today. He really was under house arrest for about two years. And during uh, his two-year imprisonment, either 8060 to 62 or 61 to 63, he wrote the letters that are usually called the prison epistles. So those are the letters to the Ephesians, letters to the Philippians, the letters the letter to the Colossians, and the letter to his friend Philemon. Those four letters were written while he was imprisoned in, in, in Rome. Um, as we go forward and we, 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 we look more at the context, who it was written to, who did Paul write? Now, he wrote to all those who are saints and faithful in Jesus Christ. Now, when we read the King James Version, it, was say, it says to, to the Ephesians, and to all the saints and faithful in Jesus Christ. Now, there are strong reasons why the words to the Ephesians are questioned. Um, the words to the Ephesians are not in the oldest and the best manuscripts of the, of the Greek New Testament, I understand, based on, on my reading. That's what some of the interpreters, inter, um, biblical scholars, um, have indicated. Um, and when you look at letter, it's the most impersonal of Paul's letters. You know, when he writes to some of the other um, churches, he calls people's names and who he stayed by and who helped him and all of that. Um, the indication is that Paul and the recipients of the letter didn't really know one another uh, very closely. The letters to the Ephesians and, and to the Colossians have very much the same message. And, but the letter is definitely from Paul. And it's from Paul to all those who are saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. And it is written to the saints everywhere, to all generations, because he says to all those who are saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. So it's written to believers and it is written to churches even of today, even of today. Now, why, why did Paul write this, this letter? And um, he, he writes to the Ephesians, I believe, for at least two reasons. First, he writes to reveal the purpose of God for the whole universe. And secondly, he writes to encourage the church to walk in a spirit of unity. When we go through the, the, the passage, the, the entire book, 
you will see words like together uh, and words like one and together and one appearing very often in chapter one, chapter two, uh, chapter four. And, and, you know, so he wants to encourage the, the church to, to walk in, in, in the unity of the spirit in, in oneness. And he wants to reveal the purpose of God for the entire universe. There are certain special features, and I want to let you know a little bit about the city of Ephesus. Um, at its height, or its, its, its greatest glory, Ephesus was the most important city along the coast of, of Asia Minor. It was a great commercial city. Its natural harbor and, and strategic location on one of the main roads of the world made it such a, a great commercial center. However, in the middle of the first century, the harbor had silted, and it silted up so badly that trade had declined astronomically from the days of, of the Ephesian glory. The great temple of Diana, or Artemis, was there. Diana was the goddess who had a very monstrous head and many breasts and, and focused upon the sensual pleasure of the flesh. The, 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 the worshipping pilgrims found their satisfaction in prostitution with a host of priestesses who promoted the cult of the goddess. Um, a great trade of silversmiths had developed over the years and, and tourist commercialism boomed throughout the entire year. And when you, when you look at Acts chapter 19 with Paul's encounters there in Ephesus, you will see uh, where, where we get this impression about Ephesus. As the years went by, the great harbor silted up more and more, and the, the Ephesians depended more and more upon the trade that came from their religion and their superstition. The natural harbor of Smyrna, and you see that Smyrna is, is also a little northern, you know, northwestern um, of Ephesus, and it's right there on the coast as well. And um, that the, the northern harbor of 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 um, Smyrna, it lay very close by. It became more suitable, a more suitable port, and it began to take away more and more of the commercial traffic of Ephesus. As a result, Ephesus became a dying city, living on its past reputation as a religious and philosophical center. The great city of Ephesus had a spiritual disease, and that was, was of sensual unrighteousness. And um, the disease did its work of corrupting the people. The people were sensual and self-centered, and they lost their will and their willingness to, to, to apply commendable trade. So the disease of Ephesus pro proved mortal. And Jesus, in Revelation chapter 2, he writes um, a letter to, to the church at Ephesus, and he warns them that they would crumble and their lampstand, the light will die out. And, and that's exactly what's happened. So that tells us a little bit about the city of Ephesus. Um, with regard to the church at Ephesus, it had some very small beginnings. And, and this is again, is taken from Acts chapter 19. Uh, when Paul visited Ephesus, he found only about 12 believers in the city. They had been won to the Lord by the immature but very impressive orator, preacher, Apollos. And as a result, they had been misinformed about the presence of the Holy Spirit. They, they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, you can have the Holy Spirit in your life and um, that the Holy Spirit could op occupy the life of a believer. And they, um, you know, they was aware that the Holy Spirit had already been sent into the world so after Paul's instruction to, to these 12, um, and he laid hands on them, uh, they were baptized. They asked them, you know, uh, they were baptized. He said, well, what, you never heard about the Holy Spirit? Well, what, what baptism would you, did you have? They said they were baptized in John's baptism. So they got baptized again, and he laid hands on them, and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they, had, they, they began to speak in tongues and so on. And the Apostle Paul went on and he taught for about three more months and he many miracles were done by him signs and wonders were done by him so much so that there were some occultist people who tried to imitate and cast out devils and one demon possessed man had those seven sons running and packing naked 
because it says they said they, they tried to cast out devils in the name of Jesus that Paul spoke about. But um, the demon said, well, Jesus, we know, and Paul, we heard about, but who are you? So all of these things happened, and Paul continued to teach. And But the Jews, they hardened their hearts, and they refused to believe the gospel. And they murmured against the message. So Paul moved the church into the school of the philosopher of um, Tyrannus. And there he preached for, for about two years. And during this time, it said that the church was instrumental in sounding forth the word throughout all of Asia. So all they which dwelt in Asia, and according to Acts chapter 19, all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and, and Greeks. And as I said before, the Lord worked special miracles by Paul in Ephesus. The church witnessed some amazing things. And from all the evidence, um, the spectacular was necessary in order to get through to the people. As always, God did everything he could to reach people. And these experiences show the great love and, and movement of God towards man. As you read the book of Acts um, chapter 19. In, in viewing these accounts, background in mind, Ephesus was a hot bed of oriental magic and superstition. The people were an emotional and a sensual group, easily moved to feelings. And um, they were devoted people, active people, loving people, and equally lovable people. Because if you read Jesus' letter to them in Revelation chapter 2, you, you will know that they were loving people and lovable people. And, you know, Venus also is the goddess of love. So that's not strange. Uh, the Apostle Paul preached God and he worked miracles. Many believed, you know, even like clots and so on, healed people and all of that. The church grew mightily. And the believers gave great evidence of changed lives by living for Christ right in the middle of an immoral and pagan society. On one occasion, the church demonstrated its newfound faith by building a great bonfire and, and, and setting aflame all its pagans, pagan books and, and magical literature and, and, and so on. And you find all of that happening in the book of Acts. So that, that is some special things about, about the church at, at Ephesus. You'll see in, in this next map, the seven churches that Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation chapter two and three. You have Ephesus right there at the, at the, at the coast. And then when you go a little further north, you have Sna also at the coast, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and La Laodicea. And um, these are the seven churches that Jesus wrote to in the book of, of Revelation. And here is a, an image of, of this um, goddess of, the, um, of love, this goddess of love, where we ugly face here and so many breasts and, and so on. So what is the great message of, of, of this book of, uh, that Paul wrote, the book to Ephesians? And the great message is it was one of reconciliation. In chapter two, we see how man is, is divided against God and man is also divided against man. When you jump down to chapter 4, he addresses the issue of harmony with Christians. Christians are out of harmony. And Christians are not only out of harmony with each other, but when you go to chapter 5, you see that Christians are also out of harmony with God. And then when we go down to the end of chapter 5, you, you will see that family members are also divided. And then we jump to the six, and we see slaves and masters, or in our context, employees and employers are divided against each other. And then when we go um, in various parts of, of, of the book, you know, Ephesians 2, 2, Ephesians 6, 10, 11 and 12, Ephesians 3, 10, 50 and 15, Ephesians 1, 10, 20 to 21, and you jump even into Romans chapter 8, verse 18, you see man is out of harmony with, with cosmic powers. Um, in Romans 8, 8 to 18, we see man's division against, against nature. E Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10 says, God, having made known us unto us the mystery of his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So Jesus is going to one day become, become all in all. But right now, at the time of writing, 
man is out of harmony with, with, with the cosmic powers. Um, so the whole point uh, is that, that it's a message of reconciliation. But what we ought to note is that Christ is the one who reconciles all things. You know, in the diagram to the top right, you see people who are sinful, and there is this great gulf between people and God who is holy. But Christ is the bridge between people and God. And of course, the cross is what is where Christ made that bridge. So we can now have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who reconciles man to God by his blood, the blood that was shed on the cross. Christ reconciles man to man by bringing all men together in one body, which is his church. Christ reconciles Christians to Christians by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and giving us individual gifts and functions for each one of us to perform, as we see in, in chapter 4. And then when we jump to chapter 5, we see that Christ reconciles believers to God by the power and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then also in the lower part of chapter 5, we see he reconciles family members to family members by giving the example of Christ's love for the church. And we have some wonderful teachings there that is a good guide to husbands and wives, husbands and wives in, in the family setting. And then lower down, um, we see that he reconciles slaves, employees to masters, and, uh, by putting both on an equal footing before Christ. That is one of the things, even within marriage, the equality of, 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 of male and female. And then we jump down to, to, this, to chapter 6, where we, we see that God, Jesus, enables man to overcome the cosmic and spiritual powers and the evil forces of the universe by the armor of God, by the armor of God. And, and that gives us a kind of, 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 of summary of, of, of the book to some extent. There are four great pictures in this book of God's redemptive, redemptive purpose. In chapter one, we, uh, we see that we are God's elect, see God's election. In chapter two, we see, and also parts of chapter one, we see God's reconciliation. And then we also see God's body, which is his church. The church, the followers of Christ. And these are some very redemptive pictures that are reflected in, in this book. Let me give you a little more detailed outline, which more or less will be um, the topics that we will review over the forthcoming weeks. First of all, we look at the Christian wealth. In chapter, well, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the call of God and, and the greeting. And we're going to end with that, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. But from next week, we'll talk about the Christian wealth. And we see, first of all, there is an eternal plan of God for Christian believers. From verses 3 to 23, which most likely we will deal with in our next session. We have the blessings of God, we have the knowledge of God, and we have the power of God. And that, that is, that is the, the Christian wealth. And as a consequence, we have the life of the Christian believer. Uh, uh, we look at the believer's life before conversion, when he lives his life without Christ. And we look at the believer's life um, during conversion, which is a work of God's mercy. And secondly, it's a work of God's grace, which is salvation. And then we, we look at things that we must remember. Remember what life is like since Christ came into your life, which where you got reconciliation and peace with God. Remember who you are. And we have six pictures of the church. And then we, we look at the eternal purpose of God for the Christian believer, that we are a new body of people. And that's a great mystery of Christ. And then we are, what, what does a mature believer look like? A mature believer in Christ. So what does that look like? And we see the Apostle Paul's great prayer in chapter 3, verse, verse 14 to 21. So I call this whole area the, the Christian wealth, the believer's wealth. Now, when you, if you're a poor person and you, you come into wealth, your life's supposed to change and your lifestyle's supposed to change. 
and you you therefore have a different lifestyle a different way of walking so the believer's wealth should lead now into the believer's walk how should we live out this christian life and we are told in in, in these passages that we must walk worthy of our calling we must walk using our gifts we must walk differently from the Gentiles. We must walk putting off the garments of the old man. We must walk following God. We must walk as children of the light. We must walk carefully and strictly. We must be wise, redeeming the times because the days are evil. Walk wise. And then we see how we must walk at home. The believing wife and husband walk in a spirit of submission and love. Then we talk about parenting and, and, and children. Believing children and parents are to walk under God's authority. And then we talk about our relationship with, with uh, civil authorities, uh, people in the job market and so on. Slaves and masters, employees and employees walking under God's authority. And, and that basically is, is what we see here in terms of how the believer must walk, how the believer must walk. And then the book ends, as we deal with the cosmic powers and so on, with the, what I call the believer's warfare. And there we talk about the armor of God and the Christian soldier's armor, because we are in a warfare. And we have a few examples of, 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 of faithful Christian soldiers that the Apostle Paul refers to. So that basically is what the, the whole study of the book of Ephesians is, is going to be about. That is That more or less is, is the outline. Now let's just spend a little time on verse 1 and 2. And it's not going to be very long. Now, Paul begins the letter to the Ephesians with one of the greatest subjects imaginable. And that is the call of God. Nothing could be any more meaningful to someone than to be called by God. And in verse 1, we see the call of Paul by God's will. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So there was God's call to Paul. Paul says he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And this is very, very instructive. There are a few things that we, we could say about that statement. Uh, Paul was greatly privileged. There, there is no greater privilege in all the world than the privilege of serving Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the very son of God himself. He is the supreme Lord of the universe and in all its enormity. No matter how far out of the, uni out the universe reaches, no matter how many universes there are, Jesus Christ is the majestic Lord of the universe. He rules and he reigns as God Almighty. So there could be no greater privilege than serving the Lord Jesus Christ, the sovereign majesty of the universe. And we need to reflect on that. We put our service in, uh, uh, to so many other things, giving it priority over our service to Jesus Christ. It is a tremendous privilege to be called to serve Jesus Christ. Now, he was called to be an apostle of Jesus by the will of God. Now, the word apostle uh, simply means one called and sent forth on a very special mission. Uh, we're not going to take the time to go to a deeper study of, 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 of apostle. We're just going to leave that as, as that. One who is sent out on a very special mission. And the mission given to Paul was that of a messenger. The Lord Jesus Christ called Paul to proclaim the glorious message of salvation to the world. Not just to the Jewish people, not just to the people in Jerusalem, but to the world. And I dare say to the, to, to the world of every generation um, following. Jesus Christ, you see, is the savior of the world. John 3, 16, everybody knows that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
to save the world. Anyone who believes on Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So there is no limitation to, to the message of Paul in terms of, of, of audience. And as we think about that, we must bear in mind that God needs, Christ needs messengers. Messengers who will take the glorious news of salvation to the world. And this was the call of God to Paul, to be a messenger of Jesus Christ to the world, to the world. And that is a glorious, a glorious privilege. Uh, in, in John 15, 16, Jesus said to his original disciples, he says, I not, you have not chosen me, you know, but I have chosen you and I have ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it unto you. So the purpose of Jesus calling disciples is to bring forth fruit and fruit that will remain. And this is how the Father is glorified. And because you are pursuing God's purposes, whatever you ask in his name, it is unto you. So it's a very, very uh, important privilege to be called of God, but we are called, he is called to be a messenger of Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy 1, 12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who was enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. It was an honor for Paul to be called to be in the ministry. When I look at this verse also, and also Paul's writings and Paul's lifestyle, I get the impression that Paul was possessed by Christ. You know, um, in the book of Philippians, he talks about him laying hold on that which for which Christ has laid hold of him. So Christ had a hold on him. The supreme Lord and majesty of the universe had condescended. He humbled himself to come to this earth to save this world. God's very own son has, has given us the privilege now of knowing him in a most personal way as our savior and Lord. Paul knew Christ. You know, in, 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 in the book of Philippians, he says that I may know him. I count all things but dumb for the excellency of the knowledge. He knew Christ Jesus. He knew him personally. He knew him as Savior. Imagine knowing God, the Son of God, personally. There is no greater privilege that could exist. Some people, they, they, they take pictures of, 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 of um popular people that they meet and they post it on Facebook and this and that and they put it on their walls, you know, they were, they, they had this president and so on. I have a picture of my mother when she, she met Queen Elizabeth in England and so on. But there's no greater privilege than knowing the King of Glory. Paul knew Jesus personally, knew him as Savior. Paul knew this, and therefore he surrendered his life completely to Christ. All that he was and all that he had Paul turned it over to Christ. He was literally obsessed and possessed with Christ. He said, count everything about down. I, forgetting all these things that are behind, I reach forth to what's before. I press towards the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Of course, that is in the book of Philippians, but it is giving us an idea of, of the depth of Paul's statement here when he says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of of God, by the will of God. He was really sold out to Christ. He lived for Christ and he lived for Christ alone. Christ was Paul's savior, but he was also Paul's Lord and master. He was possessed totally by Christ. He was, he was not his own to do his will. He belonged to Christ to do only as, as, as Christ will. Similarly, how Christ came to just do, do, do the Father's, do the Father's will. You know, uh, and Jesus had said to his disciples in the book of Matthew, he says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Uh, in another place, Peter began to say, lo, we left all and we have followed you. Everything is, you are more important than everything. You know, um, in, in the book of Luke, Jesus says, he says, whoever he be, of you that doesn't forsake all that he has. He can't be my disciple. So you see, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is deeper than just believing in Jesus Christ, being a believer. 
Jesus is calling us to be disciples where we will forsake all and follow him. And if you're not willing to do that, you can't be a disciple of Christ. Uh, in Luke, he says, um, no one has left house or parents or brethren or wife or, or children for the kingdom of God's sake who, has, who, has not, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come get everlasting life. So Paul was totally sold out, called to be an apostle by the will, by the will of God. Paul was called by the will of God. Who he was and what he was doing was God's will. His work, his employment was chosen by God, not by him. He had not chosen the ministry because it was a good profession to enter into. He, he didn't choose the ministry because some friends thought it would be a good idea if you'd be a preacher. He was a minister because God had called him to be a minister. And it, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing when you know that you are doing God's will. How many of us are sure that what we're doing, our profession, our work, and so on, are, are right where God wants us to be? That's a very powerful, reassuring we are working and serving where God wants us, where God wants us to be. Are we in God's will or out of God's will? I remember when I was working in the bank, you know, people would say, you know, when are you going to go into full-time ministry? And I used to say to them, I'm already in full-time ministry. I serve the Lord full-time. <laughs> I don't serve man on, on, on my prime time and God on my off hours. You don't only serve God when you spend two hours in the church on an evening. Your whole life must be sold out. And, and, you know, even as I say this, I, I want to caution us, you know, that those that are in a corner and wait for some clarion call, some angel to appear for you, some light to appear in heaven and say, this is the way walk, walk there in. Um, when we look at scripture, and I, we're going to reflect even on, as we reflect even on the Old Testament, the call of God and the life of, of Daniel and of Joseph, as we studied in our last series, was no less a call than the call of God and the the prophets that he called, like Jeremiah and all of these people. You read a book, you read about Daniel and Joseph, and you see how they served in, 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 in Babylon and in Egypt. They didn't serve in no temple, but their commitment to God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, commitment to God. You know, even with Daniel, when Daniel was in the lion's den, and the king cried out to him, Daniel, Daniel, did the, did the God whom you constantly serve, was he able to deliver you? The God whom you constantly serve. So even though Daniel was serving the king, the king knew that Daniel was constantly serving God. He had that kind of witness. So you don't have to be a pastor or, or full-time church ministry to be called of God. You could be called of God in Babylon. You could be called of God in the corridors of power. You could be called of God in our boardroom. You could be called of God before a, a, a class in a secondary school or a primary school. Your profession must be one of, of where, where you know God has called you to accomplish his purpose. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, whosoever shall do the will of the Father which is in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. And they said, look, you know, your, your, your brethren outside, your mother outside uh, to you. In Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul says, you know, even as you're working there, out there in the marketplace, you must not um, work, uh, serve, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And he, in Ephesians 6, 6, he was talking about secular work. He wasn't talking about uh, what we call ministry. When we talk about ministry, we talk only about serving in the church. In James chapter 4, verse 15, it says, you know, don't say today or tomorrow, I'll do this and that and that, because, you know, life is like a vapor. You ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and we shall do this, this and that. So we, what I'm trying to say is that we must always be in the service of the Lord. And being in the service of the Lord doesn't mean always giving out a track and, 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 and bashing a Bible. But whatever you do, you do it unto the honor and glory of God. Because in, in the end, according to the Apostle John, the world is going to pass away and it lots thereof. But those who do the will of God abides forever, abides forever. 
And so he is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And who he's writing to? Yes, it says here, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. I told you about Ephesus already, so I don't want to emphasize Ephesus, but I want to emphasize the saints and the faithful. That is who he's speaking to. He's speaking to the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who the book is written to. So he, God's call, God doesn't only have a call to Paul as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but there's a call to the church and its believers. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was God's call to the church. This is Paul's greeting to the church. And it is very similar to the usual greeting he gave to all churches. And he's actually covering the scope of God's call to the church and its believers. So there is God's call to believers to be saints and faithful. That's God's call to believers, to be saints and faithful. Now, in the Bible, the word, the word saint does not refer to just a few people who have done great works for God. God. And after they die, some, some religious leader says that they are saint. No. The word saint means to be set apart, consecrated, sacred and holy. A saint is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who have been set apart to live for God. The saint has given himself to, to live a sacred, consecrated and holy life, all for the glory of God. Believers are saints. We are saints in the sense that we have been given a new heart by God, a heart that is renewed and, and recreated in righteousness and, and, and true holiness. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, the Apostle Paul says that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this is, this is a call, call to be saints. He says in the book of, of Colossians, because I told you that Colossians has pretty much the same content as, as Ephesians. He says uh, in Colossians 3.10, and I've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Everybody knows 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So we have be become saints in the sense that we have been given a new heart by God, a heart that is renewed and, and, and has been recreated in righteousness and true holiness. And we are saints in the sense that we are set apart to live consecrated lives, holy lives, yes, in this world, in this immoral world, just like the saints of, of Ephesus. And I spoke to you about the immorality of, of, of Ephesus. Paul, I, you know the scripture I always quote from Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just reasonable. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Even Peter, Peter says um, uh, in 1 Peter 1, 14 to 15, and as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And when they talk about conversation here, they're talking about behavior, in all, in all your behavior. So we are saints in the sense that we have, we have been given a new heart by God, a heart that is renewed and, and recreated in righteousness and true holiness. And we are saints in the sense that we are set apart to live consecrated and holy lives in this world, in this world. So we are called to be saints, but we are also called to be faithful in Christ. The word faithful means someone who has placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A faithful person is someone who has looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ and who has believed on Jesus that Jesus Christ could and would save him has believed that, that, that Christ has counted him worthy, or rather, that he has counted Christ worthy of his trust. He has placed his confidence in Christ and, 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 and 
and in, in the word of Christ. He has entrusted his salvation into the hands of Christ. He has committed his life to Christ. That is what the faithful in Jesus Christ means. Very simply, the faithful are those who have surrendered and set their lives apart to Jesus Christ, trusting Jesus Christ to save them. And this is the very first call of God that he gives to people to be the saints and the faithful of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone should make absolutely sure that God counts them among the saints and the faithful. Because if God doesn't count you among the saints and the faithful, there's going to be no escape from enslavement and the corruption of this world. And that is, and most tragic of all, your end in eternal death. You know, in John chapter 3, uh, verse 14 to 15, and I sometimes quote this when we have communion, um, the Apostle John says, as, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Every one of us must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we may have everlasting life. In John 3, 36, uh, Jesus says, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. For the wrath of God abides on him. So it's very important that we come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that we answer the call to be saints. And then God calls believers to grace and peace. So we are called to be saints. We are called to be faithful in Jesus Christ. And he calls us to grace and peace. Now, grace is probably one of the most meaningful words in, in, our, in the English language. The Bible means something far more than what men think of when, when we say grace. Eh? But when, 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 when men say grace, they mean that something, that quality within a thing that is beautiful or joyful. Maybe the fragrance of a flower, the, the rich green of a grass, the, the beauty of a lovely person. They say, wow, she has grace, eh? grace and style. Grace is anything that has loveliness. It could be a thought, an act, a word, a, a person. And then you have grace that is a gift, a favor that somebody might extend their friend. And, and the favor is always freely done, expecting nothing in return. And the favor is always done for a friend. So, so, so grace could, could, could mean, you know, um, all the favors and the gifts of God. All the good and perfect gifts of God. All the good and beneficial things that God gives us. All the good and beneficial things that God does for us. Whether they're physical, material, or spiritual. You know, James 1.17 says, Every good and every perfect gift comes from the Father above, with whom there is no variableness. Ephesians 1.7 the Apostle Paul says, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In Ephesians 2, 7, he says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. So all the favors and the gifts that God gives us is a grace of God. Grace is the, the favor that God showers on men who did not deserve that favor. When the old, early Christians looked at what God had done for men, they, they had to add a deeper and a much richer meaning to the word grace. For God had saved sinners, those who had acted against him. Grace became the kindness and love that God freely gives to his enemies, men who are without strength, ungodly, sinners, enemies, aliens, the commonwealth of God. So no other word so expresses the depth and, and, and wealth 
of the heart and mind of God, like the word grace. And there's a distinctive difference between God's grace and man's grace, because whereas sometimes we do favors for our friends, and then we are said to be gracious, God has done a thing that is unheard of among men. He has given his very own son to die for his enemies. God's grace is not earned. It is something that is undeserved, something that is completely unmerited. That's God's grace. In Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, the Apostle Paul says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man, lest any man should boast. God's grace is a free gift. God extends his grace out towards men. In Ephesians 2, 4 to 5, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Thank God for his grace. Thank God he has called us to grace and to peace. God's grace is the only way we can be saved. Uh, in Romans uh, 5, 15, the Apostle Paul says, If through the offense of one, meaning Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, whereas by one man, Jesus Christ had abounded unto many. So the only way to be saved is through the grace of God because no one can earn it. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, he says, I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given to you by Jesus Christ. So God has called us to be saints. He has called us to be faithful in Christ. And he has called us to grace and peace. Grace and peace. Uh, Titus 3, 6 to 7, the Apostle Paul says to Titus, salvation, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to, to the hope of eternal life. So we we'll stop here for now because if we go into anything further, it will be um, it will be very 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 deep and it will take some time. So when we come back next time, we want to go into the Christian wealth, and we're going to pick it up from from Ephesians chapter one, verse three. But for the time being, we just want to understand the the context of the book, the background of the book. I've given you an outline of the study, what we're going to go, what we're going to look at, what the Apostle Paul um, is, is saying to this church at Ephesus. Much of it he also says to the church at, at, at Colossae. And um, we understand that there is a call upon his life as an apostle, one has been sent out to a very special mission. And he is sending this message to all those who are saints and who are faithful in Christ. And he extends the grace and peace of God our Father from the Lord Jesus Christ to us. So I'll pause there for a while. And um, if anybody wants to make any comments before we close, we have a short night tonight. I'm not promising you that the other nights are going to be as short. Uh, we're going to be going into a little more depth and taking a little more time. But if anybody wants to make a comment or ask a general question as, as we look at this book and as we do this study, we will take note. So you can just unmute at will and, and share your thoughts or your expectations or, or your questions. Anybody? Okay, so if we don't have any comments, I suppose it was just introductory. So we didn't get into anything controversial and, and all of that. We could probably just close off in prayer. And we see you live on Sunday morning in church for normal services, 7.30 and 10.30. And then next fortnight, we come back at this time when we delve deeper into the, into the, Christian, into the Christian wealth. Into the Christian wealth. Um, I'll ask uh, Sister Jenny Santa's close. Are you available to, to dismiss us in prayer tonight? 
Yes. Good night, everyone. Father, we thank you for your time and your word. We pray, God, even as we go through the book of Ephesians, Father, we will get enlightenment in your word. We will be rooted and grounded and built up, dear Father, in the name of Jesus, that we'll know how to walk, how to stand, how to be a faithful Christian for you and in your service. Father, we pray that you will just take control tonight. Those of us who have to be at the prayer breakfast tomorrow, Father, we pray you will wake us up on time, that we can get there on time in the name of Jesus. And we pray, God, that you continue to cover us with your blood. Help us to have a restful night in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks all for tuning in and have a wonderful night. Take care. Bye-bye.